Well, it's good to see everyone this morning. Welcome to church. Glad to be here this morning. Looking forward to what's speaking to our hearts this morning, challenging us. I hope you've come prepared to do that. Uh, I, I've said it before and I'll say it again. I'll continue to say it. It's up to us to prepare ourselves to hear from the Lord. Uh, we can't just show up and expect something. God tells us, if you want to hear from me, you need to prepare yourself. You need to prepare your heart, your mind. Um, put away any distractions that have happened this morning or this past week. Focus solely on what God wants to speak to us about this morning. Man, he's already done so through the music. All of those hymns we sang this morning, great songs. Um, so that's the challenge. So take your Bibles, please. Turn to Genesis chapter 19. We're going to look at most of chapter 19 in Genesis and then read one verse in Luke 17. So if you want to put your finger there as well. But I want to talk to you this morning about remembering Lot's wife. Remembering Lot's wife. We've heard this story numerous times, I'm sure, but like I have said before, if you ask the Lord to show you something new, something fresh, he said he'd do that. Uh, we we uh, tend to use that sometimes as an excuse not to read scripture. All right, I don't even know those verses, preacher. I know the story. I can tell you the story. I'm sure you could. Maybe even better. But I'll challenge you this morning to say, Lord, speak to my heart. Show me something new that I can apply to my life, or even something that I can share with somebody I know who's going through something. So let's begin here in Genesis 19. The Bible says, And there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom. And Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. Isn't that interesting? Here he is living in this simple, wicked, abominable city that he recognizes. God says, speaks to him in some form or fashion. He says, hey, these two guys walking up, they're special. And he, even so much so, he bows in front of them. So he knows he's probably in trouble. Verse 2, he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, and tarry all night, and wash your feet, and you shall rise up early and go on your ways. And they said, Nay, but we will abide in the street all night. And he pressed upon them greatly, and they turned in unto him and entered into his house. And he made them a feast, and they baked and leavened bread, and they didn't eat. But before they lay down, the men of this city, even the men of Sodom, come past the house round, both old and young, all the people from every quarter. They called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came in to thee this night? Bring them out unto us, that we may know them. Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him and said unto you, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Behold, now I have two daughters which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you and do, uh, do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing, for therefore they came under the shadow of my room. See, folks, remember, it doesn't just affect you. Here, think about this. Lot is offering up his own two daughters to these vile, disgusting people. He says, do whatever you want to them. So sin's not just affecting him, it's now affected his family. And we'll even see that again, how it affects his family. Verse 9, and they said, stand back. And they said again, this one fellow came into sojourn, and he will needs be a judge. Now will we deal worse with thee than with him? They pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. The men put forth their hand and pulled Lot into the house to them and shut to the door. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find the door. And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides? Son-in-law, and thy sons, and thy daughters, and whatsoever thou hast in, thy, in the city, bring them out of this place, for we will destroy this place, because the cry of them is waxed great before the face of the Lord. And the Lord has sent us to destroy it. That's where our world is right now, folks. The cry of wickedness is wax has come up before God. His judgment is about to fall. You can mark it down. 14. And Lot went out and spake unto his sons in law, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. Get this. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons in law. His testimony had been destroyed, y'all. They thought he was joking. Oh, wow, look at you. What are you, a comedian or something? You're joking, right? Man, this is funny. His, his testimony was gone. That's how important, y'all, our testimony is uh, to this world. 
They see us, they see the hypocrites that we see on, you know, that we hear about in the news about pastors, you know, embezzling or doing whatever. And they look at that and they say, man, that's a Christian. I don't want anything to do with that. Why would I want to be that person? You know, that's why our testimony is so important. <clears throat> uh, 15, when the morning robe rose, then the angels hasted Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. While he lingered, the men laid hold upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters. The Lord being merciful unto them, they brought him forth and set him without the city. It came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad that he said, Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. And Lot said unto them, Oh, not so, my Lord. Behold, now thy servant, uh, behold, now thy servant hath found grace in thy sight. Thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast showed unto me, and saved me my life. And I escape, and I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me, and I die. Behold, now this city is near to flee unto, unto, and it is a little one. Oh, let me escape thither. Is, not, is it not a little one? And my soul shall live. And he said unto him, See, I have accepted thee concerning this thing also, that I will not overthrow this city for the which thou hast spoken. Haste thee, escape thither, for I cannot do anything till thou come thither. Therefore the name of the city was Zoar. The sun was risen upon the earth when Lot entered into Zoar. Then the Lord rained upon Sodom and upon Gomorrah brimstone and fire from the Lord out of heaven. And he overthrew those cities and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities and that which grew upon the ground. But his wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt. And then in Luke 17, Jesus himself references this story with just one verse. Chapter 17 and verse 32. Three words. And that's the title of the message. Jesus said, remember Lot's wife. Let's pray, please. Father, again, we do thank you for the opportunity we have to gather in your house this morning. I pray now that you would use this preaching time, Lord, to speak to our hearts, or challenge us, convict us. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would have the freedom to move among the, the seats this morning, God. I pray, Lord, that we would put away any distractions, anything that would uh, turn our mind uh, towards anything else other than the scripture, God. I pray that you would use me this morning as your vessel. God, I can't do this without you this morning. I need your power. So, Lord, just be with us this morning. Lord, we pray that you're honored in everything that's said and done this morning. We love you, Jesus. Thank you for loving us first. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Remembering Lot's wife. In the Luke 17 passage, Jesus has just been asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God will come. His answer is to warn them to be ready for the coming of the kingdom. <clears throat> it's like the flash of lightning that instantly lights the sky. I'm sure, we've all seen that. It's fascinating to see it from a distance. You know, to see the light, the, the night uh, overcast sky just lit up and lightning. No clouds and whatnot. It's just beautiful to see. <clears throat> he also compares it to the coming of, of the flood in Noah's day and to the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah in Lot's day. So those who here, uh, here are warned to be ready to go when the Lord comes. They're warned against turning back for anything. In the, in the middle of his teaching, uh, Jesus tells those listening to him that they should, what, remember Lot's wife. You know, nowhere in the Bible are we told to remember Abraham. We're not told to remember Isaac or Jacob. We're not commanded to remember Ruth or Rahab, David, Joshua, but we are commanded here to remember Lot's wife. Why? Of all the people in Scripture that we should remember, why Lot's wife? We're told to awaken our sluggish memories, look back to the death of one soul who passed through this world, <coughs> lived in sin, and died in sin. We're told to remember Lot's wife. What is, what is there to remember? She was married to Lot. She lived in Sodom. <clears throat> Before God's judgment came on the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, she, along with her husband and <laughs> two unmarried daughters, were forced from the city, literally dragged out of the city. They were commanded not to look 
back as they were fleeing literally for their lives. But what happens? She disobeys and instantly, immediately, she's judged for what she did. She looked back. They're all commanded not to look back, but she disobeys. That's what we know. But when we study her story, we can learn even more about her, how she lived, why she died the way she did. So evidently this morning, there are some lessons that we can learn from Lot's wife. Our assignment from the Lord is that we remember her. So in keeping with the Lord's command, I want to preach for a while on that thought, remembering Lot's wife. First of all, we see, consider her spiritual privileges. What were they? Well, she was privileged in her relationships. She was privileged to be married into the only family on earth that was serving the one true God. How? Well, we see first she saw the clear faith of Abraham. This man who was called the friend of God in James chapter 2 was her husband's uncle. She had witnessed his dedication to the Lord. She had seen his altar. She had seen him worshiping the one true God. She had seen him operate in the power of God and deliver her own husband from sure death. Remember that story when Abraham took a group of his own men to go down to rescue Lot's sorry soul? He did. She saw that. She was privileged to be associated with one of the greatest godly men who ever walked this planet. She also saw the cloudy faith of Lot, even her own husband. Now, we know Lot was a man of many spiritual failures. We can read his story in Genesis 13 and chapter 14. What does he do? He trades his tent for a townhouse. But in spite of his failures, the Bible, get this, still calls him a righteous man in 2 Peter. So his wife could have benefited from his faith, but she fails to do so. See, that reminds us this morning that one's relationship does not save somebody. Yeah, your mommy and daddy might be saved. They might have started a church or helped build this one or whatnot, but guess what? They don't save you. Amen. You might come to church. You might have perfect attendance. You might have half the Bible memorized. You might teach a class, sing a special, come out and uh, do help clean up the church, all those things, but they won't save you. Only faith in Christ will save you this morning. So for us, mom and dad, the responsibility of parents, especially us fathers, us dads, is to set the right spiritual and Christ-honoring example for our kids. Look, we've, we've just read an example, and I can think back in my own mind to, to, to families I've seen whose parents didn't care about the things of God. Yeah, they were Christians, they were saved, they, they loved Christ, but guess what? It wasn't a priority to them. What was the priority? It was little, uh, their kids' uh, ball games on Sunday. Well, preacher, we got, we, we got to attend this ball game. It's important. Really? When you stand before Christ, what's he going to say? Why that, was that game so important? It means nothing. It means nothing in the long run. Set the right example, Bob and Dad. You are the spiritual leaders of the house. <clears throat> she was also privileged in, in her revelations. Think about it. Because of her relationship with Lot and Abraham, she learned a few things about God. She was acquainted, first of all, with his deity. And she knew who God was and how one is to approach him. She learned this from her husband, from his uncle, yet she never followed through with it. Man, how many sit in church pews even this morning and know who God is and how to come to him, but they fail to act on what they know. I'm telling you this morning, it's got to move from the head to the heart before it can save your soul. I heard a preacher say one time, some people are going to miss heaven by about a foot from here to here. Yeah, you might have the head knowledge, but that's not what it takes this morning. Amen. She was aware of the destruction. She wasn't clueless when those guys showed up at her door. Even if she didn't really know, she could tell a lot knew who they were. God even graced her by sending angels to warn her. He didn't have to do that. 
Abraham begged for their safety. He didn't have to. He could have destroyed all of them. But she refused to flee from the wrath of God. That phrase there in our text, from behind him, it carries the idea that she was lagging far behind Lot and the two girls. She knew what was going to happen, but you know what? It didn't faze her. And how many here this morning know the judgment that is coming? And still, you do not flee to Jesus for refuge. Only a fool walks into hell with his eyes open to its reality and closed to God's proximity. She was also privileged in her responsibility. Again, here's a woman who knew the facts, was given every opportunity to act upon them. She was given the chance to change, the chance to believe, the chance to be saved. And she squanders all those chances and she dies lost without God. Now, what a privilege it is, the privilege of conviction. See, one, one day, guess what? Holy Spirit's going to remove himself from this world and that conviction is going to be gone. Well, some of you might be feeling right now that tug at your heart, the Holy Spirit said, hey, he's, he's talking to you this morning. Guess what? One day it's going to be gone along with your chance for salvation. What happened no more? She was lagging behind. See, when God calls you, when he speaks to your heart, it's not to hurt you. It's not to harm you. It's just to remind you that he loves you. He wants you to be saved. He wants you to live the right life. The second thing we see, we need to consider her spiritual problems. You know, for thousands of years, men have wondered why. Why would she look back? There's three spiritual problems that Lot's wife had here in her life. We see them in the passage. And they answer that question this morning. We first see first the problem with her faith. She didn't believe. It was disbelief on her part. She, she looked back because she did not believe that God would do what he said he was going to do. She thought he was bluffing. There's many this morning that think, oh, God's not going to descend send destruction to this earth. He didn't do that. He, he's, he loves everybody. Yeah, I'm tired of hearing that. Or here's another. We're all God's children. No, we're not. We're all God's creation, but we're not all God's children. Amen. She didn't believe. Oh, God's a God of love. He wouldn't do that. Come on, Lot. I mean, God, God loves everybody. He wouldn't descend destruction. Sure, he wouldn't destroy our friends. He wouldn't destroy our livelihood. Man, you got a great job going on. Why would he do that? Lost people still make that same gamble today. Again, let me tell you, friend, he's not bluffing. You think not? Ask the rich man in Luke 16. In hell, he lifted up his eyes, it says. Ask Judas Iscariot. There is a hell, and you will go there if you do not come to Jesus for salvation. It's chastisement for the child of God who chooses sin over the will of God. So no, God isn't bluffing. We know that sin is a hard taskmaster. I love this saying heard years ago. Sin will take you farther than you want to go, keep you longer than you want to stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. The next problem she had was a problem with her faith. Her face, excuse me. It was disobedience. She, along with the others, had been commanded not to look back. Don't do it. But there was something within her that caused her just one more peek. That's all I want. Just one more little peek back at that old life. I can handle it, preacher. And I can go back to that old life just for a split second. I just want to take one little peek at it. It cost her. See, the problem with Lot's wife was that she had her eyes on all the wrong things. She was looking back at a lost life, a lost lifestyle, and a lost city. There's a song by a, a family that we love to listen to, the Rochesters. If you've never heard of them, I highly recommend them. They're great. 
uh, kind of a bluegrass type style of bloodbath, uh, play acoustic instruments and whatnot. But there's a song that talks about this story called Don't Look Back. And there's a line in that song that I always love that says she traded a lifetime for a memory that would last. And she did. That one little glimpse was it. Let me tell you, wherever your gaze is fixed this morning will determine the path taken by your feet. We live in the middle of farm country here, don't we? Sure, some of y'all might remember before all the high-tech things and tractors and whatnot. You know, even the ones now that have GPS, that's crazy. Air conditioning and radios, man, who would have thought? But what would happen? The farmer would hitch up his, his, his ox or his mule or whatever he had to, to plow his field, and this is how they would do it. They would pick a point on the other side of the field, a tree, a fence post, something. And they would get the mule going, and the only thing they would look at the entire time, they wouldn't look at the mule, they wouldn't look around them, they wouldn't look at the plow, they kept their eyes focused right on that point the entire way across. Why? Because that was the only way they could get a straight line to the plow. If they uh, wandered their gaze just for a little bit, they would look back and their road would look like this. Crooked. I think that's where some of us are this morning. We don't have our gaze on that finished prize, Jesus. We're looking all around us. We're looking at this world, the things that are happening. We're, we're, we're consumed with worry and all these other things when we should be focused on Christ alone. Amen. Don't let fear dictate your life this morning. Man, you know what happens when you do? That's a sin, by the way. Okay? When we do that, we are saying, God, you know what? Yeah, I know I've read in your word that you did all these miracles through Jesus. You spoke this uh, creation into existence, didn't even use your hands, but you know what? I'm so worried about what this is going on, what's happening right now with whatever the situation may be. I don't believe that you can handle it. So I'm going to sit here and worry about it. I'm going to sit here and be scared about it. I'm going to let fear dictate my mind. I'm going to let fear dictate the way I live my life because I don't think you can handle it, God. <clears throat> yeah, don't be that way. Don't let Satan have a victory over you this morning. Don't let him have that, that demon of fear invade your mind this morning. Fix your gaze on Christ. That's why maybe some of you here that aren't saved, that's why you won't get saved. That's why some of you have trouble living right for Christ. Your gaze is fixed on the wrong things this morning. That's a dangerous way to live. Cost Lot's wife her life. And God's plan as it's laid out in his word is a, is a perfect plan for us. Those who follow it man, will enjoy blessings and peace. Those who reject it, plan for living, they, God's plan for living, and find their path strewn all over the place with disaster and all problem after problem. Man, it's just, it, I can't wrap my mind around why people would want to live that way. Is the Christian life perfect? No, we have problems too, okay? We can look at this unsaved world, we and people I've known throughout the years, and all kinds of problems because they won't give their heart and life to Christ. I'm thinking, man, why would you continue to want to live in that misery? Man, what are you looking at this morning, folks? You see a problem with her focus. It was deception. She probably had everybody in her family fooled. Oh yeah, mom loves Jesus. Yeah, she's told us. They probably thought she was saved. And yeah, she had everyone fooled, but you know who she didn't have fooled God. You see, the problem with Lot's wife is the problem with many people today, maybe even here this morning, they've really made a profession of faith, but they've never truly been born again. I referenced this, I think, last week or week before in a Wednesday night message about how people will always throw that you can't judge me in your face, right? Don't judge me. Well, guess what? The Bible says we're supposed to. 
okay? We can't judge your heart, but we can judge your actions. So if there's no fruit there, if there's no desire for the things of God, guess what? All you had probably was an emotional experience. Okay? Let's just put it out on the table this morning. That trap of easy believism and eternal security, man, those are two of the most weak things that ever come up by me. So many people have fallen into that trap of easy believism. Oh, yeah, preacher, I said a prayer when I was five, six. Really? Well, from my baby's point, the way your life is going, the way you live in your life, it don't seem like anything changed. Can you be friends with the world and friends with God? So, yeah, Lot's wife was never born again. She proved what she was when she looked back to Sodom. You see, her body was out of Sodom, but her heart was still there. Man, she wanted to go back. She didn't believe God was going to destroy it. No, he won't do it. I'll, take, I'll just take one last peek, just for memory's sake. That's a picture of the religious person, that church member who has turned over a new leaf, but who has never been truly converted. There's a difference in claiming to be a Christian and in being saved. Okay? Man, when you're truly saved, you will not want to be able, you won't be able to enjoy the pleasures of this world, the, the pool of this world like you used to. It will, it will, it will turn your stomach spiritually. You'll have a disdain, I believe it. it'll have a bitter taste in your mouth. You can't, you can't stand it anymore. You'll be, you'll be like Job was. The Bible says Job is skewed evil and hated it with righteousness. So if you're just pretending to be saved this morning, man, be aware that you're not fooling the Lord. He knows your heart. And he's going to judge you accordingly. Now, by the way, Christian, listen, you're here too. It's possible for those who have been saved to find themselves looking back, longing for that old lifestyle they used to live inside. You see that trend in churches today. Everywhere there are professing Christians, they want to they dress, act, walk, and talk like the world. People who say they know Jesus but act like the unsaved around them. You know, what you're doing, you're playing around with sin, and you're treating it too lightly. You're playing a spiritual game of Russian roulette, and you will not win. And sin is a deceiver. It's a killer. It's dangerous. We went over to uh, Lake Tobias the other day uh, to the little wildlife zoo thing they got over there and we went to the reptile house and, and they had some pretty nasty looking snakes in there. If you know anything about me, I don't like snakes, okay? Uh, I, 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 they're not, well, I'm sure they're, they're worth something, but uh, if you ask me, they're not. But So yeah, we went and saw those things and you know, they had uh, some anacondas and whatnot. I remember when we were living in uh, North Carolina, they have a Museum of Natural uh, Science up in Raleigh. We would go there, they had snakes from North Carolina, like the copperhead and the cottonmouth. Cottonmouth was about that big around, it was huge. Deadly things, things you definitely wouldn't want to reach down, pick up, and start a pet like you would a puppy dog, okay? Why? Because as soon as you get comfortable, guess what's going to happen? It's going to latch on to you and inject its venom into your bloodstream. That's what sin does. We like to say, oh, that's a, look at my little pet sin right here. Isn't it cute? Yeah, I can handle it. Look at it. It's so sweet and gracious. And eventually what happens, that pet sin gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And the venom that's within its mouth eventually latches on to, our, to us, poisons our heart and soul. Don't think you can play with it. It will destroy you. And then number three, consider her spiritual punishment. See three things about her punishment. First of all, it was sudden. When the judgment came, it was swift and sure. So yeah, you might walk in sin for years, but one day judgment is going to come. It might not be here on earth, but it will be up in heaven when you stand before Christ. You know, we, we hear those words Jesus said, when we stand before him, uh, we all think we're going to hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Well, let me tell you something right now. Not every Christian is going to hear those words. 
Yeah, you'll be you'll allowed to be ushered into heaven. You'll spend eternity with Christ, but you won't hear those words. Not everyone will. Only the ones who were the true and faithful servants of Christ, not the carnal Christians. One day there's not going to be any more opportunities, no more altar calls, no more church services for a chance to repent. There's going to be nothing but judgment, swift and sure. I challenge you to flee the wrath of God this morning. We also see that their punishment was, their punishment was serious. The Bible says she became a pillar of salt. Instantly, the judgment of God fell on her. And her judgment came in spite of her unbelief. A friend, it's not going to be a pillar of salt for you, but it will be an eternity in hell. Yeah, we don't like to talk about that, do we, too much, but it's a reality. Right now, there are people in hell who could, if they had the chance, would, would scream out to us, don't come here. Remember the story of the rich man and Lazarus? What happened? The rich man says to Father Abraham when he sees Lazarus in heaven, he says, send somebody to tell my brothers so they don't come to this place. And if we could open up the portals of hell right here on this floor and look in, the people there right now would be screaming to the top of their lungs, don't come here. got the chance to avoid this place. Take it. Instantly, if you die without Christ, there's no purgatory, no spiritual waiting room. Instantly, you will open your eyes in hell if you're unsaved. Then we see that her punishment was settled. Again, for Lot's wife, there was no pardons, no second chances, no hope. She was gone, lost forever, and there's nothing that could be done about it. So my friend, the time to prepare for the next world is today. 2 Corinthians 6, 2 says, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. And when your time runs out, there's not going not to be any opportunities after death. Again, no pardons, no paroles, no purgatory. There's going to be nothing for you but justice and judgment, and your sentence will be settled Forever. But there is grace today if you come to Jesus. Jesus said in John 6, 37, And in him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. He told us what a great example he gave. Jesus gave to us in the story of the prodigal son, right? The prodigal son goes off. Uh, basically tells his father, hey, dad, I wish you were dead, so give me your money, give me my, my half of the inheritance now. Goes off, blows the money, okay? On, the Bible says, right is living. Once the money runs out, his friends abandon him, ends up in the pig pen. Here is a young Jewish boy feeding hogs, okay? Something no Jewish person in their right mind would ever do. Comes to his mind, comes back to his senses, the scripture says, heads back home, and what happens? Daddy is waiting right there at the end of the driveway to see. Every day, the father would be out there looking. Is he coming home today? Is he coming home today? He finally sees him in the distance. And what happens? The Bible doesn't say he stands there, you know, tapping his foot, saying, boy, where you been? You know how much trouble you've caused me? You know how much heartache you've caused me? Get in the house. I might just make you a servant. You might end up keep feeding the hogs. <coughs> no. Doesn't say that, does it? He didn't wait for the boy to get to him. And then this, this is a great picture. This, that's the only time in Scripture we see a picture of God running. The Bible says the father ran to meet his boy. Hugged his neck, put new shoes, new clothes on his finger, had a good old barbecue, okay? Big old celebration that his son was back. That's what is going to happen today. If you're here this morning, you're not saved. You're going to have the chance to come, accept Christ as your Savior. And guess what? The Bible says that angels in heaven rejoice. They throw a party in heaven, basically, y'all. Okay? Amen. And God the Father, get this, God the Father, who never gets up off the throne, does for that occasion. He 
stands up off the throne to look at that new child come to him. So yeah, there's going to be hope if you respond to his call this morning. There's salvation for all who will come to him by faith. Now see, there's some people who would tell you, well, salvation is only for a certain group of people. You know, what a wicked thought. But my Bible says, I don't know about yours, but mine says, for whosoever. And then shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. Anybody, don't matter where you're from, don't matter what you look like, what language you speak, don't matter what your background is, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. Amen. That can be you this morning. Man, wouldn't you rather have hope than hell? The Bible calls it the blessed hope that we have of spending eternity in heaven one day. With Christ. Wouldn't you rather have the joy of salvation rather than the judgment of sin? And you can, but you've got to come to Christ. So we need to remember Lot's wife this morning. Not so that we can revive an ages old painful story, okay? But so that we can be reminded that this life that we're living today is fleeting, it's temporary. James says that our lives are nothing but a vapor. Here one second and gone the next. And as you pass through this world, you can, you can do no better than to come to faith in Christ, be saved. So the lesson from Lot's wife this morning is this. Take God at his word. If he says it, then it's going to happen. And we need to be ready to meet him one day. So with that in mind, let me say this. Hell is real this morning. Judgment is real. Death is real. The only way to safely navigate your way past those very stark realities is through faith in the Lord Jesus. So this is the invitation this morning. If you're lost, like Lot's wife, and you want to be saved, then you come to Christ this morning. He will save you. If you are saved, but you're, you're guilty of looking back at the world and living like the world, he's got the forgiveness and the, the restoration for your soul. So whatever your need is in your heart, there's help in Christ this morning. And you only get the help you need if you come. He's waiting, just like the Father with open arms. He's waiting to receive you to take that burden off of your shoulders and put it on his, he said. Then why would you want to keep walking around with that burden? And he's ready and willing to carry it, pick it up for you. Carry you too, if needs be. You know? I love that old poem. You don't see them around much anymore, but it was the footprints story. You can see the picture of the footprints on the beach, right? And the story would go simply like, you know, we, Jesus, we were walking along, we saw both set of footprints, but then I was going through this problem, this trial, and then I only saw one set of footprints. Where were you, God, when I was going through that trial? Where were you when I needed you the most? And the story continues, he says, child, that's when I picked you up. That's when I carried you through that ordeal. Through that trial, I was carrying you through that whole thing. I never left you. I never abandoned you. And don't forget that this morning, folks. You might be going through a trial. God hasn't forgotten you. He's not abandoned you. If you can look back and only see one set of footprints, guess what? He's carrying you. So if you're here this morning, you're not saved. I, I beg you to come to him this morning before it's eternally too late. You're going through a trial or a problem this morning, you need to cry out to God for help, and the altars are going to be open. So you come to Him this morning, whatever your need is.